need to do things like this. And I have to say that when I started out um, working at WBCSD and was invited to do keynotes, I felt very humble. Um, and I also felt that there was an expectation that I would make you feel empowered. To be honest, working in this space day after day, it becomes increasingly more difficult to remain optimistic. And yesterday we started COP27 in Paris and the news this morning is not great. So I'm going to start off by being a bit provocative. And Dan, you said that the world expects more from business schools. I disagree. The world expects different. More of the same is what got us to where we're at. It's the same with business. We need a radical change in the way in which you do research in the way in which you engage with your students and the way in which you're producing the next crop of leaders. Because what you're doing today, I'm afraid to say, is not fulfilling humanity's ask of you, which is to do different. And today I want to present to you what I've been asked to do, which is the role of business and sustainability. Um, and it's intended to show what our members um, at the WBCSD are all about. So just a quick question, I um, just want to get the pulse of the room. Who's ever heard of this lot? See, not many, but we are the most uh, um, longest standing business association in this space. We've been around for 26 years and we represent some of the world's largest organizations. So this is where business comes to discuss sustainability, to to set out pathways for radical change in the systems that are there. And of course, you can look at the logos and going, yeah, really? What are these companies? They're part of the problem. But they're also acknowledging that they need to be part of the solution. So first thing, get familiar with the World Business Council and its members, because there's a lot of research that you can do to advance your students' understanding of what business needs and business is saying they are going to achieve. WBCSD, as I said, has been around for 26 years, but the work that I think we're most known for, apart from the creation of the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, is Vision 2050. This was started in 2008 and launched in 2010. And as you can see here, a, a group of companies got together to set out what they wanted to see what a sustainable world could look like, how we could actually get there. And what role can business play in ensuring a more rapid transition towards a more sustainable world? It set out in nine economic pathways the vision that each of those pathways would aspire to, as well as actions along the way to achieve it. And this is what it looked like. As typical as you would see in a business publication, it sets out an inspiring vision. It sets out pathways and actions. And we launched it to greater plumb. But the world is not a static state and producing a piece of research, which I suppose this is, even with all the signatories that came with it, is not sufficient. It needs to remain fresh and dynamic. So this was launched in 2010, but already at that same time, we saw Stockholm Resilient Institute start to bring out science that was proving that the world had a budget and that that budget was not being um, adhered to. We were overshooting what was safe for business and for humanity to operate within. So that resulted in a very disturbing period that we call the turbulent teens. During this period of time, we saw radical changes in our understanding of what sustainability meant. Oh, and before I get carried away, who here is brave enough to define sustainability? You're, you're the cream of the crop when it comes to academic academics in, in the business space. You teach sustainability, but what is it? If I go and look at the search engines of academic publications, there's at least 2,500 2, workable definitions. No one's defined it, but yet we teach it. And I have a job that involves its title. So I've actually had to come up with my own definition and perhaps I'll share that with you later. But for me, sustainability is not what you think it is. But what we've learned in the last 10 years is that in spite of having a roadmap, in spite of having a vision that business coalesced around, action was poor. And we are still seeing 
that the issues that we face today were getting worse. So in 2019, the WBCSD felt it was necessary to revisit Vision 2050, this time to involve the scientists in ensuring that we knew where the direction of travel needed to be, to take a systems transformation approach and not to look at it in isolation, to create a common narrative that transcends different sectors, to provide documents, research, insights that could form key strategic inputs for leaders to develop their own strategies. And those strategies need to be cognizant of what's going in the natural world as well as within society. And to create something that could be engaging for people to act upon. These are the companies that were involved in the development of Vision 2050, and it was their CEOs that put their name to it. But I can also say that this was a three year piece of work that resulted in thousands of engagement opportunities across all continents on the planet. Even during the pandemic, we were able to ensure that the inputs that we received from civil society, from academia, as well as the business community and policymakers was heard. So what have we created? Well, it's interesting, since 2010 right through to 2021, the shared vision has not changed. Business at WBCSD believe that we need a world in where nine plus billion people are living well within the boundaries of the planet. This is a vision that embraces this concept of a social foundation and an ecological ceiling. But what do we mean by nine plus billion people living well within the boundaries of the planet? That doesn't mean that everybody aspires to a German high-end car sitting in the driveway. People living well in the next decade are where everybody's individual rights and dignities are met. And that society and that humanity has equal opportunities and they're available to all. And what do we mean by planetary boundaries? How many of you in business schools are actually teaching the budget for planet Earth as part of your accounting? How many of you are teaching as part of your strategy classes the importance of forming strategy within that safe operating space for humanity between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling? In 2015, the world got together in Paris and agreed to a 1.5 degree cap on the global temperature. We're on a trajectory to 3.7 degrees based on the way we're behaving today. And in the last seven years, we haven't really made any inroads in changing that. We've made loads of promises, but none of us will be around when those promises are being delivered. And that, I think, is a sobering thought that we are generating leadership decisions today that we will not be accountable for when the goals and ambitions that we have made come to fruition. So ladies and gentlemen, the problem we have today is that we are living with three significant imperatives that must be addressed. And these should be formed as part of the core curriculum of any business school intervention. We are dealing today with a climate emergency. It is no longer a risk. And if you are a climate denier, well, then we need to have a chat. But we are dealing with a climate emergency. What does this mean? It means that operations management is directly related to what's going on with the planet's planetary systems. It means that you can no longer assume that, oh, these once in the life events or these black swans will come once around. They're not. These are dirty ducks that just need a good wash. They're more frequent. Once in a lifetime storms are now once every other season. Nature is in crisis. Since 1970, 68% of known species have gone into extinct. 25% of soil on this planet is highly degraded to the extent it is no longer productive. But yet in that same 40 year period, we have tripled our resource usage, whilst only 8.6% of all that we produce is reused, recycled, repurposed. Are you teaching consumption and growth as a measure of success? Well, if so, you are failing the planet. Circularity and this concept of re 
it's building circular principles into the design of it and innovation processes is not working because we are still putting 91.4% of everything we produce into landfill. And there's mounting inequality. The pandemic only highlighted that. The gap between the haves and the have-nots is growing wider. Now, it was mentioned in the introduction that I'm an accountant. I'm proud to be one, but I didn't enter the profession to service clients. I entered into the profession and was proud the day I received my diploma and my license to operate because I entered into what I believed was a profession that acted in the public interest. And I know that can sometimes create a chuckle, but that is my belief. Are you producing leaders who act in the public interest or in the self-interest? Are you producing leaders who are paying for an MBA or other intervention at your business schools for a self-return or for a return in the public good? And I think these three important issues that I put on here, the imperatives, are something that must be taught in business schools. Business schools must collaborate with the social science faculty and with the environmental faculty, the Department of Physics, and anybody else that's got research out there that says, please do different. Because this is not going to be um, the job of any graduate of your school successful in, in the future if you're not familiar with what the world is actually facing. How many of you are familiar with the Planetary Boundaries Framework? Two hands. That is shocking. Maybe three hands. Three, four. Well, let, let's just put, let's, let's get to an agreement that there are way too few. But this is the budget for planet Earth. This was launched in 2011 by Johan Rockström, who is a scientist formerly at the Stockholm Resilience Institute, now with the Potsdam Institute. This science, which is beyond repute, has shown that for the nine boundaries that we have for a safe operating space for humanity, in 2010, we were already overshooting them with projections that we would overshoot most of them by 2050. Now, there's one piece of hope in all of this, and that is the stratospheric, stratospheric ozone boundary. For those of you that are old enough to remember the 80s when we had big hair and hairspray and aerosols and backcombing and all the other things that we probably are delighted we didn't have digital cameras for, that was reversed through policy as well as business innovation. And we are seeing that planetary ozone boundary is starting to repair itself, but the others are actually getting worse. The science continues to evolve, and in 2020, it was launched again. This time, it was showing that not only have things got worse, but they've got worse quicker, with both land system and phosphorus cycles going way beyond. But of course, today is the 8th of November, and yesterday we started the COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. And this is the quote from the Secretary General we are on a highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator. And I worry that many of the graduates of business schools are actually pressing the accelerator harder. How can you help put the brake on? How can you create courses that acknowledge that climate hell is very much a reality? And it's often said that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Perhaps we need to make those good intentions steer ourselves away from the catastrophe that we're facing. So it's a time for action. I have a lot of friends that I studied with in Belfast who were medical students, and I've, followed, I've watched their careers with interest. And obviously, they've had an interesting period of time, let's say, in the last few years. But I've also noticed that there's been a radical shift in the way in which we teach the doctors of tomorrow. And I'm just wondering, is this something that the business school should consider? Back in the 1980s, 1990s, when you were taught medicine, you started off with the sciences. You learned the hardcore stuff. You learned physiology, anatomy, biochemistry. Then you went into therapeutics, microbiology, pharmacology, and pathology before you got your hands near a human being. Nowadays, medical students see a human being within the second week. 
and they are no longer taught in discrete scientific, scientific topics. They're taught in systems. They're taught to look at the reproductive system, the digestive system, the endocrine system, so that they take a systems approach to treating, preaching somebody that's made up of a whole load of systems. Are we not doing that in business schools sufficiently well? Are we still welded to teaching accounting? And by the way, we're teaching accounting as if we're on the Titanic. We don't look over the bow of the ship. We run around counting the fixtures and fittings and then run to the back of the ship once a year to check the engines are still running as a measure of going concern. Are we, do we need a radical shift in the holistic way in which we teach business students of tomorrow to become the leaders that they need to be? At WBCSD, we have taken this system approach and we have identified nine more pathways, this time not looking at economic pathways, but at systems. The energy system, for example, the living spaces system, the materials space and the food system. This way, we're looking at the holistic understanding of the role of the business leader in those sectors to look at the system with which they are part of so that they formulate solutions that are not focused on fixing a part of the system, but the whole system. This introduction to system thinking I know is being taught, but perhaps we need to make it more tangible and perhaps change our curriculum to look at systems and not just the bits of it. So time to succeed. I get up every morning and I still enjoy what I do because I know at the World Business Council, we're trying to make a difference. And I know that with the companies that we work with, that if we can get them to change, then there is significant hope for not only humanity, but for the survival of the planet. WBCSD members account for about 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So if we are successful in getting them to net zero by 2050, that is a significant contribution to the overall position that the world needs to get to. But as I said, it's time for systems thinking. Understanding where you sit within a system is complicated. Understanding what's coming can be depressing, but it's vital to understand the macro trends that we're experiencing. And many of the macro trends that we identified in 2020 are already realities. They're no longer ideas. Innovation plays a role in this. But so do other things like values and norms, financial flows, technology, information flows, et cetera. So this important focus on systems, I can't overestimate. But we need to acknowledge the barriers. And I put this slide in because I felt it was important to highlight that perhaps we're still teaching some of these, these, these barriers. We are teaching capitalism, and that's good. But capitalism, as it currently stands, needs a radical reshift. Capitalism today is very much focused on short-term returns, whereas we need as a capitalism that is not extractive, but regenerative and focused on the long term. We need to teach business students the importance of engaging with regulation and policy and not be frightened of it. As somebody that's worked in compliance, I can tell you that when you ask a board of management do you welcome regulation? The chances they'll say are absolutely not. But we need for business leaders to be advocates for policy changes that create a level playing field, not only for the business, but for the planet. We need to start getting smarter about information flows. We are so ingrained in providing accurate, reliable financial information, but yet information regarding the impact and dependencies that a business has on nature and society at best come in annually. And that is not sufficient to change decision making. We still look for financial return in the short term, which means we tend to coalesce around those institutes that give us that return. How do we provide incentives for long term investment? How do we diverse fund, div divest funds away from unsustainable practices to more sustainable practices? And when it comes to technology, how dare we set targets? based on assumptions that technology will push back limits when that technology does not exist today. But we do. We need to unlock this transformation. We need to embed into our teaching innovation and technology in a responsible way. We need to educate those that oversee innovation practices to think outside of the box 
and not formulate old ways of thinking. One of the things that I read most, most recently that's really been profound for me when it comes to education, because I'm passionate about the subject, is that it's very difficult to learn when we already know. So how are we able to change mindsets if people already know what they want? So we need to work more on not just delivering those hard skills that you get when you attend business school, but how do we create more rounded human beings to be able to have a learning mindset and more de de developmental mindset? I've already mentioned finance and investing, but are you teaching today accounting and the rules? Or are we looking at how do we account for the future? How do we address sustainable development in our day-to-day -day decision making? And how do we provide insights so that we can direct money to more sustainable practices? We've all been sold a lie in the 70s to say that growth was finite. It was like, a, as, as, as what I think the, the, the author, Kate Rareworth, has said, it's like an airplane that took off with never the possibility of landing. But is that really what the future looks for us, continued growth? Or is success something else? Do we always need new stuff? Are we contributing to that 91.4% of landfill? How do we create leaders that are not obsessed with growth and consumption, but come up with a new way of valuing what success looks like? And of course, I've already mentioned policy and regulation, and this should not be something for anybody to be frightened of. So business schools are great places to learn hard technical skills on how to do, how to ace your accounting, how to come up with all the best theories around the way you produce a strategy, how to look at operations management through the lens of just in time, great stuff. But what about the individual that's sitting in your classroom? How do we change their mindset so that they're not just learning the technical rigor that is expected of a graduate, but also those more human touches that perhaps are more essential today than ever before. At WBCSD, our members have decided through extensive consultation that there are three real significant mindset shifts that we need. The first is reinvention. This is recognizing that our current system of capitalism is producing outcomes that are unsustainable and the need to transform to a model that rewards true value creation. The second is resilience. Enhancing businesses capacity to anticipate, embrace, and to adopt to changes and disruptions in order to safeguard long term success. It's not always about just in time. Agile is great, but being able to have some slack has got many companies through the pandemic. And the final one is a regeneration, moving beyond a mindset in sustainability that doing less bad is okay. We need to get away from that and acknowledge that we are part of the problem. We have to either stop what we're doing, change direction, and be part of the solution. Now, these can be mindset shifts for a person, but also for the business. There's also a need for a change in leadership. The harsh truth is that we have overshot critical planetary boundaries and we are pushing the limits of social cohesion and stability. Sustainability was once taught as an opportunity. When I now teach it, I teach it as a necessity. Delaying action makes vi achieving Vision 2050 almost impossible. And that's going to guarantee continued pain, suffering and even collapse of society the environment and our economies. We need to ensure that all of our graduates have a shared vision of what a successful business leader is. And I believe that's different to what we have today. We need our leaders to think in systems and to acknowledge that unintended consequences are something they must address as part of that systems thinking. And we need to invest not only in making sure people ace their accounting class, but that they are rounded human beings that have empathy, that have courage, and that have compassion, not just good decision making. 
so well. At WBCSD, we've set out this now, this plan for, for, for all of our members. But I still believe that it's, it's paper. In spite of it being well-researched, well-stakeholder engaged, so what? Well, I think there are three so what's for the business school community, and these are there. Now, I get my sources from strange places. I'm not addicted to academic research because, quite frankly, life's too short. But I do like this quote from the lead singer of the band Kiss. Education, especially business education, will only give you the tools. It's what students do with the tools that, that is really what matters. Life and business, for that matter, isn't paint by numbers. You have to think for yourself. You have to invent yourself. You have an inferred fiduciary duty to yourself, and that means it is your responsibility to learn skills such as people skills and language skills in order to increase your chances of success. You also have to be at the right place at the right time with the right thing. Ladies and gentlemen, the right place is at a conference like this. The right thing is a discussion around what sustainability means. And unless you make a radical change, we'll still be here in 10 years time. Only many of us will have suffered unnecessarily because of our inability to change. It's important that we aspire to this, but more important than aspire, we need to move to action and accountability. Earlier this year, the Inner Development Goals were launched, and the Inner Development Goals make a clear statement that we will not achieve the development agenda unless we start changing ourselves. This set of five categories and 23 skills and qualities sets out the softer, more important skills that graduates of business schools need to understand. And I would encourage you to have a look at the Inner Development Goals website. The research comes from Harvard, Potsdam Institute, and many other reputable organizations. So integrate into your teaching the softer side of what it means to be a human being in business, and not just, as I said, aces on spreadsheets. And finally, we all have perverse rewards and within the, in the academic context, peer reviewed journals and the amount of effort that goes into producing those re that research is noble. I recently, well, I'm gonna be publishing a book chapter in December, along with Dr. Alison Stoll from Lancaster University, Dr. Um, Amanda Williams from IMD, and Grace um, Smith from, from, um, from Lancaster as well. It's taken seven years. And the irony is that the book chapter is in called The Academic Practitioner Gap, which one of the findings was around the speed with which research gets out to the public. You couldn't make it up. But what I encourage you to be is to serve business interest. Make your research accessible. Make sure that your research is actionable. And there's nothing more disheartening to get to the end of a paper only to find out that you haven't actually spoken to anybody in business. So use organizations like us to access them. But please, please, please do what you're doing, but shift direction to make what you're doing more impactful. Integrate sustainability into your core curriculum. Integrate it into every class that you teach and make sure that the students that you graduate from, from your institutions are human beings and not just robots. Thank you. Okay, yes. Please take a seat because you're joining the next panel. Um, and I am just gonna introduce the moderator and then she will introduce the rest of the panelists, but essentially continuing the conversation. So Ms. Adunala Okupe is a lecturer of sustainability and strategy at Lagos Business School, Pan-Atlantic University from Lagos, Nigeria. 
Uh, Ms. Akupe, her research and teaching interests are in the areas of leadership for societal change, sociocultural leadership, tourism, and leisure studies, and the impacts these have on the sustainable development agenda. She has provided advisory development services to the tourism and leisure industry, working on feasibility studies, implementing master plans, and determining the economic, social, and environmental impacts of projects. Adun holds a first class uh, honors degree in business economics from the University of Kiel, a master's in development studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, and she holds a doctor of philosophy and strategic leadership in the tour tourism industry from the University of Surrey. Welcome. Okay, All right, so good morning everyone and hello from Nigeria. So what I will do is I'll introduce the other panelists. So thank you so much, Rodney, for your keynote speech. And so without much ado, I'll call in Eric Shi, who's joining us from Korea, from South Korea. Um, and I will, I'll read his profile when also Ian Willem comes, comes up as well, who's the Global Manager for Sustainable Dubai. I think you need to, oh, okay, that's fine. Who's the, <laughs> good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so their, their detailed profiles and bios are on WOVA, and we only have 40 minutes, right? But I think now it's about 28 minutes, but I think, can we still have 40 minutes? Perfect. So you can read their detailed bios on WOVA. Thank you, Rodney, for your key keynote speech. So I'll just get straight into the conversation. And this is really meant to be an interactive session. We already have two questions on WOVA that I will share with the panelists once, once we get there. But if you have questions, you can just signify by raising up your hands or you can put it up on WOVA and I can share it. But let's just get straight to it. And I think we're starting with you, Eric. Oh, okay. Right. Um, and, you know, Rodney really gave us some key challenges, I would say. And I think that as business schools, it's really important that we start to define what sustainable business means. But also there's the challenge between business and practice and academia and practice. So can you just share with us your perspective from what's happening at your business school right now? And what are you seeing in terms of the conversation moving to sustainable business? You know, when I think of this question, first thing I usually think of is what are we good at? at SKKGSB or business school in general. I don't think as a business school, we're very different from most of uh, the things in this conference. I think business school in general, we are very good at knowledge dissemination. That means we're pretty darn good, hopefully, in training the next generation of leaders or corporate executives, the decision makers. I think we're probably pretty good at doing academic research. And I think the third thing we're pretty good at is probably creating opportunities for our students uh, in their career and chosen field. I think what we're trying to do at least at our institution is how do we approach these three that we're very good at, but try to focus them on how do we focus our energy in creating a world that we would like to live in down the road. How do we channel our resources into that? In terms of what we're doing, you know, he, something that he mentioned that really resonated with me is how do we transition from, you know, do no harm into being more proactive approach in what we do. And we really kind of start to see some of that in our own institution. And it's not really a top-driven decision on going that. I think a lot of it is actually coming from organically from our students as well as our faculty coming to me and say, hey, you know, Eric, I would like to change my course from uh, global supply chain into sustainable supply chain. He said, can I do that? Can I have some resources? Be my guest, love to. A uh, student coming to us and say, you know, in their application stage, they say, you know, what is the school offering? in terms of a sustainable curriculum. And it's kind of like, oh yeah, maybe we should really adjust some of our curriculum into that direction. I think as a thing, what we try to do is provide those resources, provide those opportunity for those things to happen. Mm -hmm. But organically, a lot of it is actually happened on its own. And we're trying to say, oh, great. 
how do we support that? Yeah. How do we support all these initiatives within our own institution to say, go ahead, go change the world and let's be proactive about it. Okay, right. Okay, so basically it's being able to provide a supportive environment that allows knowledge acquisition, but also skills and opportunities to be disseminated between the students and also how they can then work within the industry. Is that correct? Yeah, this, actually we started a new project this year because a lot of our students actually, typically in the MBA, right? We do a year and a half in the summer, everybody go out to do their corporate internship. We're actually starting seeing a group of students that actually don't want to go the corporate route. Mm -hmm. They want to do the policy. They want to do the think tank, uh, especially focusing on sustainability. Uh, in Korea, there's actually, right outside of Korea, there's an entire city built around uh, UN organization, nonprofit. Uh, our student is actually getting into internship in those organizations. But unfortunately, those organizations internship typically are unpaid. Yeah. So one of the things that we started doing is go we'll pursue those opportunities. We're we'll support you. We're we'll actually provide the scholarship and the payment okay. in order for you to do that. But from the team's point of view is, you know, how do we as a school come up with the resources to be able to fund all that? Right, and, and we're also seeing that in Nigeria at Lagos Business School, we also just launched our public sector leadership program because we've seen that it's one thing to empower students and business leaders, but then if they have to operate within a certain environment, how do we also speak to the public sector to ensure that they can do that? But then the challenge is public sector leadership is also lowly paid, and so how do you make it more attractive? Um, okay, I'll come back to you in, in a second. I think I'll go to Rodney, right? And, and Rodney, you, you really challenged us and you said many things about about how we need to start to think about mindset shifts and how to start looking at being human beings and understanding our role as human beings. But, but you know, as business leaders, right, and, and we get a lot of CEOs and OMPs, owner managers, practitioners coming to Lagos, how do you make this case when someone already sees themselves operating within such a packed schedule, such a challenging environment and seeing sustainability as a necessity? How do you connect those dots? Well, maybe before I go into that, I just had a reaction to what you said. Okay. Um, I don't believe you should be teaching anything other than sustainability as an outcome of everything that you do. Sustainability is not something that's bolted on to the curriculum, just like business ethics is not something that's bolted on as if it's nice to have. It is the outcome of every class that you take. That I feel is, is the crux of the issue here. And students shouldn't really have a choice whether they do supply chain management or sustainable supply chain management. The what I presented is clear. It should be only sustainable supply chain management. So the fact that there's even a debate as to whether it's one or the other, I feel is scary. Um, and that's where we get to when it comes to, to leadership. At WBCSD, we are CEO led, which means that the members of our companies are the CEOs. And they have acknowledged that it's no longer just a nice to have or something that makes them sleep better when they get their bonuses. It's actually something that is imperative for them to do as leaders. Mm -hmm. But remember, just having a CEO title doesn't avoid you from being a human being either. And so we have to remember that we bring our full selves to work. And that means we have to also acknowledge that, you know, we have a duty to the planet that we depend on, as well as the citizens that we depend on our businesses to thrive. So it's important that we have this developmental mindset and that achieving a leadership position does not mean you stop learning, mm -hmm. that it's a, that we have a society where it's okay to say, I don't know, and that it's not sign of weakness to say, I need help, I need to collaborate. How many of us teach collaboration as opposed to competition? It's a hell of a lot easier to compete than it is to collaborate. How do we create that mindset that allows us to be able to say that if we're going to be successful, and again, we need to define what that is, we need to get away from what we have been told is normal. Remember, it is hard to learn when you already know. So therefore, you have a duty to make sure that what they know is sustainable. And I believe at WBCSD, we are starting to see that the events that we put on that include insights on inner development are the ones that people really want to take part in because 
they know that that's the, the bit that they need to develop more. And that doesn't matter whether it's CEO or the entry level. There is always something you can do to learn, to develop, to grow, and to change what it is you believe your purpose in life is. All right, thanks, Rodney. And, and I, I just have to agree with you because uh, what, what we find in Nigeria is that when you start to talk about sustainability from an environmental perspective, people have disconnect, right? They just wonder, you know, we have so many challenges, so many issues with development. Environment just seems quite far out. Not that it's not important. It just seems that it's not as key as the people element. But when I teach sustainability and we connect it to, the, to being a human being and saying, how can you be a better human being? How are you a better employer? How are you providing a better environment for your employees? How are you thinking about your stakeholders? Then they can connect with that. And then that connects them then to the planet, to the environment and the ecological. And Jan, William, I think I would like to just get your perspective from a practitioner, right? Because what we're doing is connecting business with practice, I mean, business research with practice. And can you just share some of what you're seeing in terms of the touch points that are coming up as your role engaging with stakeholders and managing stakeholders within Heineken Company? Yeah, and uh, thank you for having me. And uh, thanks for uh, Rodney. I don't know how you felt after his speech. <laughs> Probably not very optimistic, and rightly so, because I think uh, it's good to have a wake-up call uh, in the morning. <laughs> um, I've seen, I've now been in sustainability for over, I think, 12 years, and within Heineken, and I've seen, a, let me say, a drastic change from, let me say, a company program which has been taken up by different functions and led by a central team now much more integrated into the business and i think everyone feels that uh, sustainability is part of their job that's why i truly believe that it's not a separate function of course we have a we have a central team who's coordinating and who's making strategies and uh, doing the things that need to be coordinated but in the end you would like to keep your team small because in the end it needs to be integrated in each and every detail of the business either you're in supply chain or procurement or uh, sales or commerce um, and it's not ideal because there's always dilemmas you do you need to uh, you need to counter so we will not solve it uh, uh, immediately but we have a very clear uh, clear path and i think it also, when you talk about stakeholders, it's not only about telling stakeholders what you would like to do for the coming years, but also ask them the other way around. What do you expect uh, from us? And now we're going into a phase of, let me say, double materiality. So materiality is important for financial, but also for non-financial. You see, okay, what is how? what kind of impact do you have on the world, but what is, has the world's kind of an impact uh, on you. And interesting what you say about uh, the people part in uh, Lagos. We also have a business in uh, in Nigeria and uh, there are a lot of social problems. So probably environmental is a little bit further away, but these two are incredibly inter intertwined. I'm actually not so worried about nature because nature will take care of itself in the end. I'm very much worried about people because people will not survive in a nature that in in a in a world that fails so we need we need to be and i think that also comes to the point of of rodney you you fail as a business uh when the world is failing uh you cannot thrive as a business if communities are not uh, thriving and if if nature is not thriving so these three are intertwined and I'm not saying that we all ha that we have all the the answers, but uh, at least you need to start having a clear vision and a strategy. Where do you want to go in the next five, 10, 20, 30 years? Okay, and and basically sharing it with the stakeholders and working with them and letting them also tell you what what they would like in the next five, 10, 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have and and uh, I think we are going to. Normally, you had a, a, a let me say a sustainability strategy once every ten years. Uh -huh. We now updated it for uh, for twenty thirty and uh, twenty forty. 
our mission is to become net zero in our production scope one and two by 2030. That's 10% of the total footprint. We want to close the gap by 2040, not by 2050, but by 2040 for the entire value chain. That's 90%. So you need to deeply collaborate with, uh, with your suppliers. We intentionally did that because 2050, pe most people will not be there anymore. So you cannot- That'd be carbon. You cannot take your management to, into account. So that's why we said, no, it needs to be 2040. It's a huge, bold ambition, but at least you have a clear uh, road and then you can ask uh, people, okay, can you help? Because we don't know all the answers, uh, all the answers yet. Yeah. And I think that's also part of it, you know, as business schools, it's important that we see the role and how do we also equip uh, students, our, our participants with the understanding of stakeholder engagement and stakeholder management, knowing that we don't always have to provide all the solutions, but understanding that they're probably closer to the community, they understand the challenges a lot, a lot better, and, and they also are aware of the risks that it has to their livelihoods a lot better. Yeah. Can I add one more thing? Because interesting uh, about the stakeholder part is that uh, uh, when I look back 12 years ago, there was no investor asking me any question or our CEO any question. Now you see an increased amount of questions coming in from investors. I do believe that investors are taking over the role partly of NGOs, being more and more critical because they see that there are a lot of risks mm -hmm. coming up in their portfolio. I think it's it's great because now it gets into the core of the business, uh, and I sometimes misuse that uh, as well to get things to get moving. <laughs> moving, yeah, yes. and and and. and absolutely because sometimes we also then have owners telling us that you know what my board is demanding that we need to look more at sustainability so it's coming from the investors it's coming from the board and then it's almost like the investors become the gatekeepers almost or guardians of the sustainability journey rodney well, within our membership when we talk about stakeholders one of the the interesting things that our members are saying to us is that graduates of universities really are shopping around much more as to where they work. So many of our, our companies are saying that the top graduates are no longer wanting to work in this industry. So when we talk about stakeholders and we talked about uh, the, the investor interest, trust me, it's not enough. There needs to be more and there needs to be consequences for investors not doing the right thing, but that's still to be to be debated. But when it comes to like the talent that you're going to need to be able to manage the complexity that I presented and the change that's needed. The top graduates are saying, well, I don't work there. And that puts in a whole, a whole disarray the way in which MBAs are ranked. Because, you know, there was the steady flow of the MBA to the consulting firms or to the, the, the Wall Streets of the world to, you know, into the investment houses, big bucks. That's part of the conditions for ranking. Some of the graduates of schools are now going, I don't want to do that. And I think there's a, a, a dilemma here is that ranking is linked to something that is probably not what the student body is wanting. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we also have this disconnect in the business school with the CEO coming in to say how sustainable their business is, to talk about how they're on a journey to transform the planet. But yet when the recruiters come on campus, they're not interested in sustainability. They still want to know that they can do the hard stuff. So again, we have this perversion within the system that needs to change. And you mentioned about your students demanding better. I feel we need to also just offer them better. That is why I said that it's not about doing better. It's about doing different. Don't offer them supply chain management, offer them sustainable supply chain management. Change the curriculum so the outcome is sustainability leadership, but don't call it that because it's just good leadership. I think we're obsessed with labels. We're obsessed with stakeholders. We're obsessed with, with this concept. But sustainability, I mentioned in my speech that I did, that I, one of those people that just needs to get up in the morning and know what I do for a living. And when your parents don't know what you do, you know you have to put the brakes on and work out what you do. So for me, sustainability is not a job. It's not a department. It's definitely not a course. It's not a career. It's everybody's job. It's the end result of a corporate strategy that understands and appreciates its impact and dependencies on nature and society, and which seeks to maximize the positive benefits to nature and society and eradicate the negative consequences. It is a outcome of strategy. It's not something magical. It's just an outcome. 
we need to teach people that that's what it is. It's not being a green hugger, you know, going out and hugging a tree. Trust me, it helps, but it's not what it's about. It's about being a human being that understands that you have a responsibility to formulate a strategy that produces positive outcomes for the environment and society. And as Jan Willem said, the environment will always win. Over there, we'll be in cages and they'll be looking at us. Right. Th th thank you, Rodney. I, I, I feel like you're, you're really challenging us and it's, it's good. It's a, it's a fantastic wake up, wake up call. And one other element that I would say that we need to think about, because again, it's about leadership and you cannot be leading a sustainable business if as an individual yourself, you don't believe within the, with the norms and the values in which you want to live your life and how you connect that with being a sustainability driven person and I would challenge us and I would say that perhaps that's another thing we need to look at that it's not really just about being a role or a job or something external but it also has to be something that we imbibe and, and what you said about employees again in, in Nigeria now we call them Gen, in Gen Z's the, the younger graduates they're really challenging what's happening within the world they, they're not looking for a job for life they're not even looking for work for five years five years is too long they're really they're available and ready to take on flexible work they're ready to take on short-term work that connects with what they believe and also starting to really challenge organizations in terms of how are you providing the, the solutions to the problems that are around us here in Nigeria. And what that has been is almost a wake-up call for us at, at LBS to really start to think about what we're offering. And, and this question comes to you, Eric, because what we're seeing as well is that, you know what they're saying, if your organization isn't trying to meet our needs, we're going to start up our own organizations. We're going to start up, we're going to have a startup. And, and then the challenge then comes in, how do we start to equip startups at business schools? How do we start to get them to really think about the long-term, the, the, you know, the systems, the structure, et cetera, but also saying that it's, it's important that you want to solve problems, but you also need to have the business skills that you need to do that. For many years, our students, especially in the career context, Every student wants to go into a major corporation, right? The top ends of Korea, your Samsung, your LGs. We're not seeing as much of that. I think many of our students are more mission driven in what they want to accomplish. They're more focused on doing startups, not just for the sake of, oh, there's money to be made. Yeah. Certainly there's money to be made, but the type of startup they're focusing on are more of uh, sustainable, uh, environmental friendly technology. Uh, but what we do, I think what business school, again, what we're very good at is creating a culture where they think that pursuing that non-traditional path or what we traditionally call non-traditional path because you're not going to consulting, you're not going to the IPs. But we're creating a culture where that is the norm. Mm -hmm. And it's perfectly fine for you to want to do that. And we encourage it. And how do we provide you with the connection, the networks, and the opportunity to pursue that? Uh, taking some time off, doing your studies to prepare your own business plan in pursuit of that. I think we, as a school, we are trying to do that. I think a lot of the school are doing that as well. I'm not as pessimistic about the future generation. I think we probably got it more together than us. <laughs> okay, uh, thank, thank you for that. And, and I'll come to you, Jan, Jan William, because I, I think that from, from an internal business perspective, it'll be good to hear some of what you're doing within the Heineken company in terms of preparing for, within your plan for 2040, so preparing for the change in the type of employees that will work with you to achieve these goals. So can you just share with us some of the ways that you're looking towards internal sustainable business, uh, internal sustainability as a business, but also maybe some of the lessons that you've learned? I, I know you perhaps can't share everything, but if you can share one or two, things that you've learned in this journey? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, when it comes to, I, I totally recognize the, the new generations uh, coming in because they ask all the questions they want to know exactly what we do on sustainability. Otherwise, they, they don't even want to enter the, the business, uh, either environmental or social, and rightly so. Um, uh, I think there's a clear need for upskilling 
uh, within the organization. Uh, so we do, we put a lot of energy right now to actually get everyone on board, especially the key people on, okay, uh, all the basics on climate change and, uh, and, and uh, environmental, but for sure we will also pick up uh, more the social uh, uh, part in that way. I think there is a clear wish uh for uh, for getting more information and and education so uh on on the broader uh, on the broader level um when it comes to uh, the effectivity uh i think there were a few lessons uh, to be learned i think governance is one of the lessons uh that we've learned we we had great uh, uh, commitments in 2010 29 and a part of it uh, we've achieved, part of it we didn't achieve. Uh, so we decided to continue them for the next couple of years. But we also learned, okay, what can we do in terms of governance to make it a little bit more integrated into uh, into the company? So what we did is, for instance, we linked now our uh, long-term incentive plan partly to sustainability. So now 25% of the of the total long-term incentive plan for the top 900 managers are directly linked to KPIs on sustainability. Uh, we also made sure that we now have a, um, a sustainability responsibility committee at supervisory board level. They come together four to five times a year fully dedicated on sustainability. It's also for them a learning session because we bring in all the experts in these uh, sessions to talk about uh, the net zero uh, challenges, to talk about the investor's perspective, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so here there's also, uh, it is actually governance and education uh, all at the same time. And also at an executive team level, we have a steering committee who who keeps an eye throughout the year, okay, where are we with the commitments and where we need to remove uh, obstacles. Mm -hmm. So that's how we how we want to make the governance circle uh, a, a, a little bit more of a complete, uh, a balanced uh, circle, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. And, 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 I'm and I'm listening now and I'm seeing that really a lot of it is about how do we close loops? So there are certain loops that we have in terms of feedback loops, in terms of strategic loops, in terms of governance loops, and also even within the internal businesses in terms of how employees can also contribute to these agendas and how do we really start, start to close these. Right, okay, I've seen that we have a few questions on Wover. So what I'll do is I'll touch on some of these questions before I... I come back to our, our questions. And I will start with Eric. Eric, your question is, what is your opinion about the impact of research and what kind of practices can business schools adopt to encourage research that is creating real social impact beyond merely citations? Well, they, they didn't put merely, I added merely, but yeah. Uh, several for faculty actually work our research topic related to sustainability that we were able to fund and encourage. But what I find to be the more impactful of their research output is actually not in the hardcore academic journals, in which, honestly, I remember back in my days when I write academic journal, okay, maybe three people have read it, two of them were my reviewers, and one business editor. Other than that, has anybody read it? I don't think so. Do I even know what I wrote? I don't think so. But our faculty has been, but tradition, that's what we reward yeah. in research. But what we are encouraging faculty to do is to get their research, especially uh, relating to ESG, relating to sustainability, is to create a more accessible forum, an outlet for practitioner, for managers, for executives. Uh, that will usually come in the form of newspaper column, mm -hmm. uh, usually come in the form of a practitioner-oriented books. Uh, we're encouraging that, but again, depending on the faculty, the senior faculty are very willing to pursue those paths. The junior faculty, because of their career concern, are still focusing on, you know, am I getting into the right peer-reviewed journals? I think that will take some time to change. Okay, yes, yes. I have 147 public research studies that are out there. None of them are peer-reviewed by another academic, but have been 
reviewed by business practitioners and are being used and driving impact. But I'm not accepted within your community as being a researcher. That is perverse. The research that I'm doing is published, it is reviewed, and it's being used. That, to me, is the impact of research. And as I said, my foray into a book chapter, seven years, and it's still not out. I, I, I just think there's, there's something that's broken here. I agree. If you have something that is research that is impactful, it needs to be actioned. Otherwise, you are part of the problem. You know, you can stand on it as the sea level rises. But there needs to be a shift in academia, particularly business academia, to making applied research accessible and digestible at quick time. At WBCSD, we have a professor in residence, Professor Gail Whiteman, who is uh, at Ex Exeter Business School. And we have worked with her to try and create a community of academics that would become agile and provide solutions to CEOs in a two-week window. We've never been able to achieve it. Ah, because I'm doing this or, you know, and I also, once I'm on a roll here, tenure, is that part of the problem as well? Do you as a dean struggle to get the ship changed because, well, the crew don't need to change? So... There's a lot that I think academia needs to do to understand its role and how it needs to change and how it needs to reward success. Because having a list of citations whilst the world burns isn't great. I completely agree. <laughs> I think everything here is probably facing that challenge to a certain extent. Um, how do we get away from this pure scientific mindset where you know, your credential is based on these three people actually like your work versus the impact it actually has. So in my world, scale. in my world, I'm an award-winning academic teacher. Mm -hmm. I have these lists of publications that business are using. But I, when I apply for a job in academia, I'm rejected on paper because I'm not in the right journal. And I'm not saying you should take me, but I'm saying there are people <laughs> like me that are not even getting a chance because of your system. And you are part of that system. So what are you doing to change it? I mean- Or you can be here next year saying, oh, it's all great. Yeah, I published another one. I have, I have a response, which is that I, I, I think that it's, you know, knowledge production is important. And I it think is. it is important to have rigorous academic research. But the challenge is how do you then connect it with the solutions, I mean, with the problems that we're trying to solve and also the people that we need to, to read it. And this has really been a challenge for us at, at LBS because, you know, First of all, academic journals aren't seen as very accessible in terms of the language. And part of it is saying that, can we at least have the peer reviewed journal? So you have your paper, but then how do you also then start to repurpose it and distill it in you know, newspaper columns, in podcasts, in, in documentaries? So now there's case cases that you can teach by documentaries, but also how do you really start to then almost distill a paper into different formats to meet different audiences. So that's something. And because I am the moderator, I will just share something that we're trying to do. So one area that we ha I have seen with my colleagues at Kansas College of Medicine, who is a medical doctor, is in medicine management, Bob Badgett and Cologne Business School, Celine Rajon, is that we've seen that part of the challenge is also in terms of abstracts, right? How do people even access what we're doing? And so shameless plug, and I'll, I'll put the link out there, but really we're trying to say that, can we start to improve how we also prepare our abstracts so that people can see the challenge, the solution, sorry, rather, the challenge, the, the, the research and the solution without always having to read through the entire paper, not because the paper isn't important, but we also really want to start to improve on our impact. Now I can see someone in front of me who I'm not going to, do we still have time? We still have two, oh, we only have two minutes. 
Right, okay, so I'm going to go through a couple more questions, and I think right now we can just answer them in 30 seconds. So the first question we had was, leading business transformation has a lot to do with our attitudes towards sustainable development. How do we also bring about more attitudinal change amongst the educated class in a way that doesn't also ignore environmental and social issues? And I think I'll come to you, 30 seconds if you can answer that. So basically, how do we start to change education for better? So in a way that can help, for example, Heineken Company address some of your social and economic uh, problems. Uh, yeah, in 30 seconds. Um, I, I would love to see business schools thinking and discussing uh, alternative economic models, because okay. I think basically we are still working in the same Framework. growth, model but what about alternative models like the donut uh, economy or uh, mm -hmm. there are uh, even discussions about degrowth okay how sustainable are they what can we learn from it can we can we learn can we transform our business into these models i would love to see that uh, and, and also for me i would like to see rather than us only talk about reuse recycle repurpose perhaps we can also add reduce into how we look about consumption and also how we look at, at growth now eric the question for you is how do we also encourage large corporations to share resources to support decarbonization of SMEs, both within and beyond their supply chain? So basically, how can large corporations support SMEs? One good thing about Korea is companies actually have started to learn that it's better for their business if they decarbonize. It's better for their business if they're more sustainable. Manufacturing is probably one of our biggest sector, and most of our uh, alumni work in manufacturing that is export oriented selling to other countries, particularly their clients are basically from the developed countries and they're under tremendous pressure to make sure that they meet their environmental sustainability goals. So we're talking to some of the advocates for executive program uh, just uh, last week and we're just kind of chatting and let's kind of ask them, so what's your sustainability strategy and everybody has a not everybody has a solution they're actually working on and ask them so you're doing this because you have to meet certain goals they say no it's actually better for our business yeah and a lot of companies in korea are actually on that path thank you and and and, and rodney i guess it will bring this to a nice loop close with, with you and the question i have is basically sustainable business for what what is the goal, right? So we know that it's for long term, et cetera, et cetera. But, but in a nutshell, what would you say is, just, you know, for what? well, it's our vision. It's nine plus billion people living well. And that means that we have a mindset of regenerative um, capitalism, not one of extraction, and one where we have actually compassion. I would like to see schools teach vulnerability as a strategy to teach compassion, to teach courage. It can be done because at WBCSD, we're doing it. But I do want to end on a bit of a positive note. I do want to get a reputation for being completely um, um, <laughs> disheartening because at the end of the day, you still have to get up tomorrow. But I do want to hold a mirror up to you and say, really? So in this, I'll return. I'll, I love a quote, as you know, um, but I will try and recite a poem if I can from the top of my head. Somebody said it couldn't be done, but she with a chuckle replied that maybe it couldn't, but she would be one who wouldn't say so till she tried. So she started right in with a trace of a grin on her face. If she worried, she hit it. And she started to sing as she tackled the thing that couldn't be done and they did it. And many will tell you it cannot be done. Many will prophesy failure. Many will tell you one by one the reasons to stop you proceeding. But just buckle in with a bit of a grin, take off your coat and get to it. And remember to sing as you tackle the thing that cannot be done and you'll do it. If you want to see change, then it has to start with you. Go and look at the inner development goals today and start seeing where you have gaps in your inner development and start by changing who you are so that you can become a vehicle for change in your business school. It's not all doom and gloom alone. It's hard to be optimistic. And the next two weeks, we're going to be seeing the newsreels coming out of Sham El Sheikh, which will be hard to listen to. And again, we'll see it in December with the COP that's taking place on biodiversity. But if you want to be different, then you have to start by taking a step in a different direction. 
And you have to, as, as Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. All right, thank you. And thank you everyone for your questions. Thank you for listening. I guess for us, the challenge is also, rather than only waiting for corporations to collaborate, to, to be the change we want to see in the world, but also through these couple of days, how as business schools, are we also working together to collaborate, to see how we can come up with better solutions. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.